The date was March 3rd, 2018. The time was 3.48 a.m. I and my good friend Astronomy Live traveled to Venice, Florida to capture footage of the International Space Station as it went across the moon. But the purpose of this observation was more than just getting epic shots of a lunar transit. The fact is, we had a goal that morning. We wanted to capture footage of the transit in such a way that we could actually put numbers to our observation. If we were successful, we would be able to figure out the altitude of the International Space Station. But that's not all. You could even use the data collected to figure out the size of the ISS and even its velocity. And here's the thing. We were successful. We were able to capture the transit from two different locations. This resulted in the ISS passing over different parts of the moon for each observer. By knowing the distance between observers, the altitude angle of the moon, and by measuring the parallax in our images, we were able to post not one, but two videos of our findings. My video demonstrated that the ISS is real and is at an altitude that would place it comfortably in space. Astronomy Live went even further with the data collected, confirming the size and velocity of the ISS. Both videos are linked down below, and I highly recommend you watch them, as I'm proud of them both. When debating conspiracy nuts, I would reference this observation whenever I was told that the ISS does not exist. I would reference this observation whenever I was told that the ISS is simply a drone or spy plane, or the idea that it's a balloon. Yes, people have actually said this to me. And the videos of our observation debunk every single one of those assertions. However, there is a way to make this body of evidence even more powerful. There is a way to prove just how solid our findings were. How? Well, simple. We do it again. for the final time, reset. Epic on that 
Yeah. <laughs> Dude, we got it. <laughs> Just like last time, we need to start by looking at the sight lines between myself and Astronomy Live. If we have two observers spaced apart by some distance, then their lines of sight would cross at the ISS, and as they continue, they would end up on different parts of the moon. This, once again, is called parallax. It's the exact same thing when you look at your finger with one eye, and then by switching to the other eye, your finger appears to move relative to the background. This is useful because it allows us to get a few measurements. Now, a quick note here. Back in 2018, both Astronomy Live and myself were pretty much looking straight ahead relative to our baseline in order to see the transit. However, during this transit, that was not the case. During this transit, we were actually looking along our baseline, where Astronomy Live was basically looking right over me. So when doing the math, we will need to take that into account. So instead of this situation, we are dealing with this situation. With that clarification made, we can continue. Now let's focus on the moon. The moon is a certain size in the sky. The size that it appears to us here on Earth is called its angular size. In my last video, I simply went to Google to get a value for its angular size, and it was just fine. It worked, and it still does to this day. However, for this observation, I went to Stellarium to get a more accurate value for my location at the time I was making the observation. According to Stellarium, the moon had an angular size of 0.501 degrees. With that in mind, let's overlay the tracks from my Nikon P1000 and Astronomy Live's LX200 together. You will see that our two tracks span a certain amount of the moon, which is a certain fraction of the moon's angular size. 
And by counting the pixel diameter of the image acquired, we see that the moon is 841 pixels wide. The span of our two tracks from center to center is about 149 pixels wide. If we take 841 and divide it by 149, we get a ratio of 5.6442 to 1. So, if we take the angular size of the moon as 0.501 degrees and divide it by the value we just found, which was 5.6442, that means that the parallax measures out to be 0.0887 degrees. Our next step is to measure out our baseline. To get this measurement, we will simply use Google Earth. And according to Google, our baseline measures out to be 760 meters. Now, the last measurement we need is the altitude angle from Astronomy Live's telescope. After the transit occurred, Astronomy Live cut power to his telescope. He was then able to get this measurement from the side of his telescope. At the time of the transit, we see that the LX200 was at 66 degrees. So, we have angle A, we have angle B, which means we can find angle C. Solving this out, we get 113.9113 degrees. And just like that, we have everything we need to find the altitude of the International Space Station. Now, we can do more math at this point to find the altitude, but instead, I have a better idea. All right guys, we are in our graphing program, which is gonna make our lives a little bit easier. The name of the program is called GeoGebra Classic 5. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark a point for myself. So we'll call this point red. So we'll put me right in the middle. So zero, zero, and there we are, beautiful. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a point for Astronomy Live. So let's do that now. Now, since Astronomy Live was 760 meters away, I'm going to put him on the x-axis at 760. So let's do that. And zero on the y-axis, and boom. Now, if we zoom out, you'll see his point on the graph. There he is. So next, let's go ahead and place a segment between me and him. Beautiful. Now we know that Astronomy Live was looking up at the sky at 66 degrees, so let's go ahead and put that angle in. And this would be clockwise at 66 degrees. And for me, I was looking up counterclockwise at 113.9113 degrees. Now, if I zoom out, you'll see these two points. These two points correspond with these angles. So, let's go ahead and place a ray down for that angle and this angle. Now, what I can do is I can find the intersection between this line and this line. So, let's find that. And let's zoom out. And right there. This point represents the intersection of our two lines, which represent our lines of sight, which means that this point, point A, represents the International Space Station. And if we look at its position on the y-axis, we get 409.9 kilometers. So even without taking into account the curvature of the Earth, we are already at an altitude that is impossible for a plane to reach. But let's complete our work. What is the altitude over the curved Earth? Well, let's find out. So I'm going to make another point called center. That's going to represent the center of the Earth. I'm not going to put anything on the x-axis, but for the y-axis, I'm going to put negative 6,371,000 meters, because that is the radius of the Earth. There we go. Then I'm going to use 
circle with center through point between the center of the Earth and me. Now we have the curve of the Earth to scale. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a segment between the International Space Station and the center of the Earth. Then I'm going to find the intersection between this line and the curve of the Earth. And then all I have to do is measure the distance between A and B. So the altitude of the International Space Station over the curved Earth is 412.4 kilometers. Neat. And there you have it. After reviewing the data from our observation on November 3rd, 2020, we were able to conclude that the altitude of the ISS is around 412.4 kilometers, an altitude that would place it in space. However, we're still not done here. Astronomy Live has his own video on this observation, and trust me when I say he goes into way more detail than I did in this video. So before you conspiracy nuts post complaints about my evidence or my methodology, I recommend you watch his video first. His video will be linked down below. With that, my name is Red, this has been his rhetoric, and as always, have a good night.